All right, great. Um, so first off, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I've had um, plenty of requests uh, to do kind of an OXD live stream walkthrough. Um, so this is uh, finally it. Um, if uh, you're completely unfamiliar with some of these topics, uh, there's definitely going to be something here for you. Uh, I'll do plenty of fundamental examples um, you know, that can get you kind of caught up to speed on the basics of chain analysis. And um, if you're somewhat familiar with those fundamentals, uh, this should, you know, totally help reinforce um, those concepts. Um, most importantly, you know, if you are already a little bit familiar, um, this analysis will give you some, you know, context around, you know, transaction analysis. And kind of in my opinion, that context is, is really important um, for people that, you um, otherwise are a little bit lost just kind of staring at, um, you know, addresses and, uh, and transactions. So that context should really help kind of tie everything together. Um, and so, you know, this walkthrough is going to be centered around uh, analyzing ransomware payments and activity. Um, you know, if you're unfamiliar with uh, ransomware, it's, uh, you know, the methods and process of, uh, you know, hacking into and extracting and encrypting someone else's data and then attempting to extort them, you know, for payment for uh, in return for, you know, access back to their data. Um, typically, there's kind of two main actors in, uh, in the ransomware process. Um, they go by different names that you might see out kind of um, in the tech press. Um, but in this example, I'm going to refer to them as the developers and the affiliates. So the ransomware developers, sometimes they're, they're called the gang. Um, they create the encryption software. Uh, and basically a, a campaign management platform that they then sell to affiliates um, for access. The affiliates will pay them um, for that access. And the affiliates are the ones that do the actual, you know, hacking and, uh, and encryption, and then basically the extortion part of this. So they're taking more of the risk. They, they tend to keep most of the payment with, uh, you know, the affiliates uh, or the, uh, the developers taking, you know, something on the order of 25% of, of a paid ransom. So, uh, this example um, I had found on a, a website, a public directory called uh, ransom, uh, W-H-E um, It was around earlier this summer. It's kind of fallen off a bit. I don't think that they uh, have access to that, that public list of these, these ransomware payments um, up or available at the moment. Um, but it was useful. It gave me um, a, a ton of examples of ransomware activity. Um, and I was able to kind of get a high level feel for how ransomware payments you know, uh, are handled by, you know, the affiliates and uh, the developers. Um, so this is one of the better examples that I found in that public directory. And so, you know, at the end of this, um, the full graph, the full transaction graph that we're going to have um, will really help put some of, you know, Bitcoin's default privacy into perspective for everyone. Uh, it's going to take me a little bit of time to get to the end of this. Um, so in the beginning, I'm going to, you know, not allow, uh, it'll just be kind of me talking and, and doing the walkthrough. Hopefully after we get maybe halfway through or so, uh, I can open it up to questions. You know, this way the, the, uh, the stream doesn't go on for several hours. So, um, you know, and, and I guess with that, you know, we're ready to get started. So right now what we're gonna do is, you know, I'm starting with, you know, a given ransom payment transaction. And, you know, our goal in this analysis is going to be to track as much of the ransomware developers wallet activity as possible. You know, and along the way, we're going to cover those chain analysis basics and um, you know, we'll get some, uh, uh, you know, high level uh, feel for how, you know, these payments are handled. So without further ado, I guess I'll switch over to my uh, OXT screen. Um, and this is going to be our starting transaction. So for those of you that are a little bit unfamiliar with OXT, um, I've just started by entering the transaction ID. Um, if you go to the inputs and outputs tab, we'll see the components of this transaction. We have one input and two outputs. Uh, we typically refer to this as a simple spend. Um, this is one of the more common Bitcoin transactions. Uh, and in this case, um, we have, uh, we have, uh, a handful of heuristics that we can apply to this transaction in order to detect that change output. Um, and in this case, 
we have a pay to public key hash, uh, one address format as an input, and we have uh, a BEC32 output and a P2PKH output. Um, and we also have uh, a round payment amount um, in this BEC32 output. So by using those two heuristics, we're able to, uh, you know, identify this, you know, output at index one as the likely change. Um, and we can track this payment forwards or this change output forwards and continue to evaluate, you know, the original owner of this, this input, continue to evaluate their spending. Um, so one of the things that I think some people have trouble with is they'll input an address into OXT. They'll want to look for the transaction graph tool. Um, they might not see the transactions tab. In order to get to the transactions tab, you have to log in, um, click in this My OXT button. So if you input an address into OXT, you don't see this transactions tab, you know, you've got to log in to get to that, or you can just simply put in the transaction ID itself. And to access the transaction graph tool, we'll go over to the left side of the screen, hit this little toolbar button, and the transaction graph will open. So on the transaction graph, uh, the transactions are represented as nodes or circles, and the uh, you know, transaction inputs and outputs are represented as lines. Uh, inputs into the transaction will be pointing towards the transaction, and outputs will be pointing out away from the transaction. So when I open uh, the transaction graph, I just about always head to this uh, transactions detail tab, the little I on the, this toolbar. Um, we'll have a little pop-up down here in the bottom right that shows, uh, you know, basically, you know, this uh, input and outputs tab information for the transaction. Um, you can double click on the transaction that will expand all inputs and outputs, or you can selectively expand inputs and outputs by hovering over the little uh, expand tool icon in the transactions detail tab. So this is our starting transaction. I'm gonna highlight in this case, the original payment. I just went and checked the inputs to this transaction and see to find its history. And I see that it was a payment that originated from Gemini. Uh, so these two outputs, if you hover over them, will also show Gemini, but I prefer to look at this uh, input and outputs details in the transaction details tab. So back to our original, original starting point, um, if we apply our change heuristic, we can begin to follow the, uh, the entity that's uh, responsible for making this transaction. If we come to their next transaction, we see a payment that goes uh, to Binance. I'm going to highlight that. And we can take a look at the activity around this address. It's got about 1,500 transactions uh, and has received about 6,600 Bitcoin. Uh, it has a note that's been applied by no another OXT user. And in this case, um, it, the note says it's an address that's related to the SUEX OTC um, uh, desk that was blacklisted by OFAC, uh, I guess, back in September. Um, and let me just drop this in the chat. It might be worth it for people to be able to see this. There's some details about the SUEX OFAC uh, sanctioning. And so with this address being related to ransomware, there's a the potential that some of these additional incoming and outgoing transactions to this address are also related to ransomware. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time digging into this address because that's not kind of the, the purpose of this analysis, but I'm gonna go back to that original payment, right? Which was a, a 50 Bitcoin uh, received to some portion of the uh, ransomware, you know, either gang or affiliates. Uh, in this case, it was likely the affiliate that received this payment. And what we'll see is that the, uh, the BEC32 output, this 12.68 Bitcoin, is basically exactly 25% uh, of the original received amount. So this is very, very likely to be the affiliate's uh, cut of this ransom. And so what I'm going to do going forward is, is attempt to highlight all of the uh, transactions and uh, inputs and outputs 
that are controlled by the affiliates. And when we're done at the end of this graph, we'll see it kind of at the core of that will be this highlighted kind of network of, of transaction activity that's that leads to kind of a broader network that that will be able to link, you know, all the payments that they've received. And so um, the first thing I'm going to do is just see this is the first spend from the affiliates. I want to get a handle on what their uh, what their wallet fingerprint is. So if we expand the transaction info for this. Um, you go to the technical tab, we'll see version two and a lock time that's equal to the block height. And this isn't a perfect identifier of the, the wallet that's being used, but what it does give us is, is a, a chance to see when a new wallet software is encountered in the transaction graph. And that's probably a sign that we aren't tracking necessarily the affiliates anymore uh, or the, the developers anymore. We're tracking somebody else that might be uh, involved in this kind of activity. So coming back to our first, their first spend, we have uh, another uh, like TypeScript heuristic. We have a BEC32 input, a BEC32 output, and a P2PKH output. This P2PKH output is the likely payment. So the BEC32 is a likely change. We'll click on this. I'm gonna highlight this transaction with this output being the likely change back to the, uh, the developers. And I'll expand the payment now. See where this goes. Nowhere really noticeable, um, at least not to a, a dedicated uh, or labeled exchange that we have on OXT. Um, and so instead of getting off into the weeds, I'm gonna keep focusing on this uh, 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 you know, developer wallet. And in the next spend, uh, we see that there's uh, a 21 Bitcoin output to a P2PKH address. Um, again, we can apply that like TypeScript heuristic. Uh, so this, this P2PKH address or output is the likely payment. Uh, and we also see that there's a cluster um, by the common input ownership heuristic where uh, both of these inputs are kind of assumed to be controlled by the same wallet. And it's very likely that these are because um, both of these addresses or both of these inputs need to be combined in order to make this 21 Bitcoin payment, right? Neither of these is, an, is more than 21 Bitcoin. So the wallet automatically selected both of these inputs uh, to make this payment. Um, and now I can check on this address and see if there's any additional activity. Um, this address has been reused. It's got 11 incoming transactions. And, you know, kind of in the context of our analysis, we, we know that this address may be related to ransomware activity. Um, I've already taken a look at this, uh, and I happen to know that this transaction for 73 Bitcoin that comes into this one uh, P2PKH address uh, will give us a little bit more context on some of our transaction graph uh, as we continue tracking uh, that, that developer wallet. So if I just follow the inputs to this, I eventually wind up at uh, this, uh, this cluster. And this cluster we're gonna run into repeatedly in our, in our analysis. I'm just gonna call it 3328, just to keep things a bit simple. Um, and we can, you know, uh, use OXT's you know clustering feature. Um, it collects plenty of data on on uh, on a cluster. Um, we can see how many transactions it's received, how much volume it receives or spends. Uh, this metric can be a bit uh, misleading sometimes. Uh, if there are is uh, plenty of address reuse on the input and output side of a transaction, this will be a bit inflated, um, but one of the most important metrics here is, is the number of addresses it's this in this cluster. It's a very small amount, um, but it has quite a high balance. So if you look into this a little bit more, you can start to get the, the feeling that this cluster is probably, uh, you know, some type of an OTC exchange that's located in the United States. Um, potentially, I think the East Coast, if you factor out the UTC timing of this. Um, but it has a lot of incoming and outgoing transactions, you know, during basically business hours on the East Coast. 
Um, so I'll go back to our original uh, ransom tracking. Um, this was the payment, this 21 Bitcoin payment. We'll see the next spend goes to Huobi. Um, I'm going to stop here because I don't really know if, if this was a pass-through entity. Maybe this reused address is um, some other type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, custodial entity. I'm not quite sure. Um, so I'm going to not highlight that as, as part of this graph. Um, but what we will do is now go and track the upstream um, source of the second input. So I'm going to take a look at this spend. See this. Okay, this still has the same uh, version number and lock time, still the same wallet fingerprint. But if we continue upstream, we come to uh, a P2SH address, uh, wrap segwit, and a sweep. This may be evident that we're you know, starting to see a new entity involved. Checking the fingerprint of this spend, we see version one and a lock time of zero. So this is certainly a different wallet software. The source of this transaction is another cluster. Um, we'll just call it 7323 for now with this uh, 3DTLW address. Um, we're gonna run into this entity a good bit but this is a very likely to have been a ransom payment. Um, I think this 12.8 is about 25% of the original input. So this is likely another uh, ransomware dev cut, 25% cut of a ransom. And we can play around a little bit with this, um, this source. So I wanna highlight this one. And again, we do this 3328 cluster entity, the one that we were just looking at here. So this entity uh, is potentially involved in facilitating uh, ransomware payments. It's another input. Okay, this is the one that I wanted. Um, here we have another spend from this 3328 entity to the uh, 7323 entity for 51 Bitcoin. Can follow this spend. We're looking for this 51 Bitcoin output. Here is a sweep. This may be, you know, another ransomware payment potentially. And if we open this transaction, we find a Wasabi coin join, um, nice, neatly sorted in, in ascending order of, of input denomination. And on the output side, we see our equal outputs, these mixed outputs, there you go. The base denomination 0 0.1, 0 0.2s, 0.4s, 0.8s, and so on. Those are the mixed outputs. Um, and in this case, this was a 51 Bitcoin, 52 Bitcoin input. Being the largest input, it's likely that this, well, it is certain that this is the change output that goes back to that entity. And we'll take a look at this and see if there's anything that we can't find, just briefly. Um, OXT does a nice job of, of weighting the inputs and outputs um, by amounts. So I want to check this address this change output for any address reuse. Only one incoming transaction, so no address reuse. Being that this is the, you know, a 48 Bitcoin input, you know, this uh, 45 Bitcoin output is the change again as the coins continue to get mixed. And I'll check this address now for address reuse. Okay. 
And in this case, I do, we do see some address reuse for this transaction or this address. Um, it's received two transactions. Uh, it looks like it's re it's certainly received that change output that we had previously seen. But we also see that it's received uh, a mixed output and sent that mixed output. So we know that this output um, is controlled by, uh, this mixed output is controlled by this original uh, UTXO or this wallet that controls this original UTXO. You can see what how this is later spent. It again enters a Wasabi coin join, so that's good. It's been remixed. It's not, I mean, while that previous, uh, you know, anonymity set doesn't contribute, it, it's at least not de-anonymized going forward. Um, now I could continue to track this, this large change UTXO, but the, uh, the graph will be pretty busy. Um, so instead I have a little script that I, you know, use to, uh, to, to track this kind of uh, activity for me. Um, I'm gonna drop it in the chat. Um, I think I also have I also have a paste bin link. Let me let me drop that in as well. Yes, Turk, that is a, a Python script output, at least. Um, so I've dropped, you know, if you want, you can click on the paste bin. Um, that'll uh, come up a little bit more clearly, uh, and I'll put it on the screen. And what I've done in the script is, is just calculate the, the change output and check to see if it's reused. Um, instead of chasing down all of the uh, uh, outputs to this transaction uh, in the graph. Um, this will keep uh, my, our transaction graph a bit cleaner. But what I do want to point out is that this last reused change output, if we come back to OXT, it's received this 0 0.8 Bitcoin change uh, and it's also received uh, a 0 0.2 mixed output from a previous mix. So again, this address, the 0 0.2 output is de-anonymized. It's, it's linked back to the uh, original uh, you know, wallet that controls this, this input. I'll drop this in the chat as well. And because it's de-anonymized, we now know this future spending uh, is controlled by that wallet. We can open up this transaction um, where we see kind of a large consolidation, potentially some change, you know, outputs in this as well. But what I really want to show is that, you know, going forward now, this payment um, is made to Binance. Um, we have again the uh, like type script output that we can like type script heuristic that we can apply and continue to track this activity. Um, being the way that Binance is, it has dedicated addresses for its users. Um, these addresses, in this case, are all reused. Um, they've been they've received multiple payments, um, so these potentially open the door from you know that that original de-anonymization now opens the door. Um, through this address reuse at Binance to go and link to more basically, you know, activity that's controlled by that wallet. So we've got kind of a, a compounding failure there, the original issue with Wasabi and this, you know, worse issue of, you know, kind of address reuse broadly. Um, so I'm going to stop chasing down this part of the transaction graph and get back to our uh, affiliates. So if you recall, we left off um, with this 25% Bitcoin uh, payment 
that went to the developer's wallet. We tracked both of the inputs to this transaction. We've got one of the outputs expanded, right? It was this, this uh, 21 Bitcoin payment. And uh, if we expand the change output, now we're gonna go back to tracking this developer wallet forward as they continue spending. The next transaction is another true cluster, um, similar to this previous transaction. Um, we can apply the like TypeScript output to this, this transaction. Um, like TypeScript heuristic with this P2PKH address being the likely payment. We see this address has also been reused. So we could potentially go and investigate these received transactions for more information. And some of these are quite old, August, 2017. Um, but we'll keep this a little bit shorter. Um, so I've got the, the payment expanded. Um, we've already tracked this one input. We have, we can apply the common input ownership heuristic here again, right? Neither of these two inputs was large enough to make this, this seven Bitcoin spend. So the input to this, the other input to this transaction is likely also controlled by the ransomware developers. And we'll just ch spot check this for fingerprint again, version two lock time, still good. And now we're gonna go back to tracking the inflows to this transaction. Again, another clustered, simple, uh, another clustered spend um, with uh, you know, the, this nine Bitcoin output being the likely payment. Um, this would be kind of a, a round output amount heuristic that gets applied here. Also it's unspent, um, which means it might, you know, uh, might not be that that change wallet, that change UTXO that gets used later. So again, I'm gonna just fully expand this transaction. And I have two, two inputs to follow now. I'll start with this five Bitcoin input. And this is a simple spend, one input, two outputs. Um, these are uh, much easier to evaluate for, uh, you know, the transaction history. We don't have to check on two inputs or, so all we have to do is kind of quickly surf through the graph and check on these, still the same version number, still the same lock time. Probably shouldn't be highlighting these just yet, but okay. And we come to this kind of end of the line transaction where we have two inputs from a reused address. Um, it doesn't seem like uh, our affiliate wallet or our developer wallet so far has uh, been doing any address reuse. You know, this the inputs to this transaction have a different fingerprint. And with this address reuse, this is probably um, or potentially a ransomware payment. In this case, uh, it looks like our developers received eight Bitcoin um, and that gets spent forward. So um, this is a little bit of a different kind of look to some of the other uh, received payments that we'll see. I don't think that this quite amounts to that 25% number that we're sort of looking for. So this, you know, might be, you know, it's potentially maybe a, a, a tough interpretation to make. Um, but if we keep uh, going back to these uh, remaining transactions, I think it starts to become even more clear that this is probably still related. So back um, at this transaction, we have another input to investigate. Again, uh, this looks like a 25% spend roughly. Um, this is probably uh, the developers taking their 25% cut. Um, we have another sweep from a P2, uh, P2SH address. Version one 
lock time zero. This 7323 three entity that we've already run into with this uh, 3DT uh, LW address. And again, that 3328 uh, entity as well. So this transaction was likely a, a ransomware payment. Um, and this is again, our, our affiliates or our developers uh, taking their 25% cut. Um, and what part of this transaction graph is left? Okay. So we've checked both of the inputs to this transaction um, and kind of come up against sort of dead ends to potential payments. Um, we'll now go and track this last change output forward. So this BEC32 output, we're interpreting as change. And we come to uh, another sort of cluster um, by the common input ownership heuristic. And again, um, we have a, a, we can apply the round output payment amount uh, heuristic. Uh, this unspent output is the likely payment. Um, and again, none of these inputs alone was enough to make this 5.2 uh, Bitcoin spend. Um, so this is likely a true cluster that's controlled by our, uh, our developers. Um, I'm going to highlight all the inputs to this transaction. We'll see if we can't figure out if these are potentially more uh, developer wallet activity. Uh, in this case, we have a P2PKH input. As this transaction happens at the same block time, but um, I don't think this is related um, just because we have a new sort of address format. So I'm just going to highlight this likely payment for this input. Got a 6.8 two input, a 1.705 output is, I think, another 25% amount. So this may be uh, a, a, some affiliate activity. See another cluster here. Checking the inputs for this transaction, we see Gemini. So this may have been another payment. Looking at some of this, uh, this affiliates activity. This 1.36 uh, is the likely payment. Uh, we can apply the like type script heuristic um, and potentially the, the round payment amount here as well. Um, this kind of goes off into a, some kind of a cluster here, but it looks like the change output from this affiliate is spent to Binance. Looking at this address a bit more in detail, uh, 264 incoming transactions, uh, 382 Bitcoin received. And this uh, address also has a note that links to uh, references, uh, the SUEX OTC um, blacklist and sanctioned uh, entity. So this is an interesting address to save. Going back to this transaction, I'm still looking to see, is any of this also related to our uh, affiliate spending? This is the last input. This happens to be a BEC32 input. With this 0 0.32 spend, this 0 0.36 change, this may be more of the, um, more of the uh, developer's wallet activity. So I'm going to trace this upstream, simple peel chain, one input, two outputs.
I don't have any decisions to make here. I can just expand these inputs looking for the source of these funds. And at the end of this, we have a, a P2SH address, um, which is again, received two, two outputs. The small amount um, may be kind of a test, test receive um, where the, the payment, the, the people making the payment say, hey, we're gonna send you the small amount and make sure that you get this before we send you the rest. And looking at this transaction, we also see that the version one at lock time of zero. So this is sort of getting towards the kind of the end of the line for, for this probable uh, activity. Um, but looking at these inputs again, we see this 3328 entity again, who just keeps keeps coming up in this analysis. Um, this spend of the ransom payment, it looks like uh, this 0.43 happens to be another 25% uh, cut for the, the developers. So I'm gonna highlight all of this activity. And now this field chain is linked to, uh, you know, more of our, our de developer wallet activity. Um, and I think this is probably a good point to, to open things up a little bit um, and see if there are any questions. Um, we're sort of getting mostly towards the end of this analysis. We have this, this last change output from this cluster spend to evaluate. Um, but I'm gonna go check in the chat and see if, uh, if anybody has any questions that we can uh, answer before we go forward. See. See a couple of questions from Turk. Um, how does dedicated addresses for single singular users from Binance get flagged on OXT? Who reports those addresses to OXT? Um, in our experience. Well, we know that Binance gives out static addresses for its users. Um, those addresses are then spent and clustered um, by the common input ownership heuristic. Uh, when we come across wallet patterns that look like Binance, and they do have a, a, a very similar kind of pattern, they all spend to the same address. That's when we'll then apply a label to that Binance cluster. Um, I, I think that was more what you were trying to ask. Um, we don't necessarily go and, and flag this and say this is a you know a, um, a, a single uh, you know user address if that makes sense. So, and so I guess your your last question is um, okay version number. You, you know, we know that version number um, certainly represents a, a different software. Um, but the question is, is you know, how can lock time be a distinct distinction uh, between wallets as well? Um, most wallets, most people are just using the default. Um, so I think Bitcoin Core will allow you to make a transaction with constructed that, that has a, a lock time, right? And that might throw this off, but um, most uh, software will just operate and run kind of the same pattern continuously. So if, if we see version one um, and I see a lock time when I was previously expecting kind of no lock time, I'll still kind of treat that as potentially uh, a new uh, entity. And um, we do see that from time to time where, okay, you know, there's a, um, a dedicated version number and I do see that switch. Um, I, I tend to do that because it's, you know, it's a little more conservative um, instead of just assuming that um, I, I, I tend to default to how could I be wrong is probably the way to phrase that. And if, if 
if there is like even very, a very small chance that I might be wrong, I'll kind of err on the side of being conservative, I guess is probably the way to answer that. Okay. So let me get back to any other questions before I go back to the transaction graph. Why am I making decisions that I'm making? No? Okay, good. All right. So we can sort of get ready to wrap this up. So this is the last, um, last bit of spending that we have the change output to this transaction we're coming to appeal chain and we're going forward. We have to pick which outputs we want to follow. Um, in this case, uh, we can apply the like type script heuristic where the BEC32 output is the likely change. Continue forward. I'm gonna highlight these. Another like type script heuristic can be applied to this transaction. In this case, we have, we can't apply the like type script heuristic because both outputs are to back 32, but it looks like we have uh, a round payment amount heuristic that we can apply to this first output. So the second output is the likely change. Another transaction with uh, a BEC32 output and a uh, P2SH output. So our like type script heuristic can be applied again. And it looks like at the end of this, we come to uh, a relatively large cluster with only a single output. Um, there's a ton of inputs to check in this. Some of them may be um, controlled by the developer's wallet. But going any further um, probably gets pretty messy and makes our graph a little bit unclear. Um, so I'm going to stop here, at least expand this so we know kind of where the endpoint is, and zoom out and kind of show what we've been able to, to track. Um, if you recall, this was our original starting point, this 51 Bitcoin input right, where the developers take their 25% cut. We were able to trace this activity and link, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six ransom payments. I did the math on these. Um, added them all up, something like 45 Bitcoin in total that they had received um, between, you know, kind of the beginning or middle of May. And I think the last one is sometime June. Yeah, we'll call it June. So 45 Bitcoin um, from the middle of May to sort of the middle of June, roughly a 30 day period. Um, I think that's something like $2 million in, in uh, developer income um, in a 30 day period, which is pretty crazy. Um, but, you know, this, what you can really kind of see from this is, is how tough UTXO management can be. Um, you know, you get a spend into your wallet and you want to continue spending. You don't really want to, uh, you know, necessarily empty a wallet um, or empty, uh, uh, you know, terminate kind of a UTXO. Um, at the end of, of sort of a payment, spending a full amount, um, you know, so if there are these change outputs that you can kind of continuously track, uh, you can link kind of quite a bit of uh, wallet activity. So, you know, this really kind of goes to show how tough sort of Bitcoin privacy is, you know, kind of by default. Um, you know, yes, we were able to sort of link all of, of this developer wallet activity, but um, for the most part, besides maybe one of these two spends kind of, in the middle of this graph, this reused address 
right? Which goes on to spin to Huobi. Um, and I think this was also a reused address. You know, we don't really have kind of that solid connection between the developer wallet and kind of a, a centralized exchange where we could say, oh, this is probably their address. We might be able to find some, you know, more information about them from that, that centralized exchange. So kind of in that way, um, you know, unless this, this transaction reveals something a bit more, um, you know, the, the, the developers have done, you know, even if it's a mistakenly a decent job of keeping their coins kind of a bit separate from kind of exchanges. Um, and so, you know, kind of the last little notes here are, you know, all of this payment activity from this developer wallet um, that we didn't track. Um, most of these are not going to uh, centralized exchanges. You know, so again, this is kind of, um, I call it, you know, the peer-to-peer the -peer, uh, transaction, part of the transaction graph. Um, and kind of in this, this space, um, you know, Bitcoin pseudonymity still kind of provides a, a decent bit of protection. Um, so I always like to, you know, at least kind of keep that in the back of the, you know, the back of your mind that, you know, that while Bitcoin, you know, privacy can be difficult, you know, in this case, they're sort of just not mixing their coins, um, not attempting to really hide anything. You know, we've got a handful of, uh, affiliate spends basically straight to, you know, these, these, uh, SUEX exchange addresses. Um, you know, so that's how SUEX was able to get kind of flagged so easily is that, you know, all of these spends are, you know, effectively one hop from a ransomware payment. So of course, um, chain analysis was able to find these. Um, and we had the other ones somewhere. Where was that? Here. So of course, chain analysis was able to go a few hops forward and, and find this, um, you know, this common kind of finance uh, a cluster. Um, but, you know, to go back to the sort of peer-to-peer -peer space, this peer-to-peer -peer spending part of the transaction graph, um, you know, that that pseudonymity can kind of still maintain a, a decent level of privacy, um, at least from what I can see, you know, from this graph. So I'm going to, you know, basically end, end that there. Um, okay, let me just check for a couple more questions. Okay, Turk's ask, asking. Yeah, so I was. This is the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to bookmark the OXT transaction graph and I'll drop it in the chat. And if you're sitting around surfing this later, you can you can revisit and see exactly kind of what I've done. Um, but let me see. So how do you preserve the OXT graph state? I'll show you. I'll save you a bookmark. Um, what happens when you close the uh, internet browser at the end of the day and you want to pick it up? Yeah, that's what the bookmarks are for. Um, what is your workflow when taking notes during your investigations? Do you take a note on a text file, copy pasting the addresses or transaction IDs along the way? Um, you know, kind of with your thoughts. Um, my process is probably more of, um, I'll do sort of a, a quick and dirty, uh, you know, check to get a sense of, of which way the analysis is kind of heading. Um, and as things sort of develop, depending on the timing, if this is an old investigation where UTXOs might still be, uh, or certainly probably spent, but if it's a recent investigation where the UTXOs haven't been spent, I'll, um, sometimes I'll let them sit for a little while, let the, let the transaction graph develop, let the spending take place and then go back and, um, you know, make more detailed notes. Um, usually what I do is for very simple analyses, I'll, a, a screenshot, and annotations is enough um, when it comes to like volume and timing analysis on mixers or, you know, attacking kind of more kind of technical um, areas. I'll, I'll usually make a kind of a CSV um, with incoming amounts, tracking, you know, expected balances and, and kind of additional information. So let me make the bookmark. So if we go back to the, the tools tab uh, on the left side here, this uh, bottom uh, icon is the bookmarks tab. So I'm going to call this
And that's that. So we're gonna make this public so anyone else can see it. Create bookmark. And that's that. So now I can drop this link in the chat. Um, and anybody who's, uh, you know, wants to pick up with that later uh, can do so. So this could also go, you know, when we post the, uh, the, the YouTube video, um, it'll probably go in the, the comment section or the, uh, the description section. Um, and that's kind of that. Um, so are there any other questions? I guess that's a no or go. Yeah, <laughs> I guess not. Um, okay. Well, um, I guess, uh, you know, that's probably a good place to, to end the live stream. Um, I'll sit around and, and see if anybody wants to kind of, um, you know, ask questions. Um, I'll stick around for a little bit, but, uh, yeah, I guess, um, thanks everybody for stopping by. Um, if you have anything that comes up later, you know, always give me a, you know, drop a question in the chat, um, tag me, um, any, uh, you know, here's a question on any recommended videos for more basic stuff. Um, I don't think that we should, we have linked to, um, the guides. Um, we should probably do that, um, that we've written. I know that, uh, a samurai user is working on very, very basic videos. Um, those are on the way. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I'm not going to say, uh, who is working on those just yet because they, they kind of wanted to keep that secret, but you can look forward to that. Um, you know, maybe in the coming weeks or week or two. Okay. Well, I guess uh, that's a good place to end it then.